Good morning. My name is Sam Erconan, and I am your lay leader today. Welcome to this time of sharing and worship. If you are a guest this morning, we are glad you are here. Please take time to complete the communications and prayer request form. The forms will be collected during service, and all prayers will be lifted up today and remembered throughout the week. Join us for refreshments after worship in the East Room. You're also welcome to make use of our family worship room located just outside the sanctuary in the West Wing, and the service is broadcast in there. I would like to thank Joyce Saar for the flowers today, Linda Taylor for the treats, and Melissa and Emma George for being our greeters today. And I would also like to draw our attention to the fact that Melissa and Emma are celebrating a double birthday today. As the first announcement today, I want to tell everybody that I apologize for there being a delay in getting the tax letters out. It's my fault. It's not Mary's fault. It's not Pastor Bill's fault. I had, here's my excuse. It's not really an excuse, but it's an explanation. I had two trials that were out of town, and it was just, it's been crazy the last month. But we will have those during this week. So, again, please accept my apologies, and uh, don't throw anything at me. Please review the announcements in your bulletin. Does anybody have any other announcements they would like to make at this time? Pastor Bill? I, I just would like to make sure that everybody keeps uh, Bill and Beth Wagner in your prayers and Wayne and Doris Riegler. As of yesterday, Wayne was now under hospice care and uh, Bill is Thank you. Bob, you had an announcement? I just wanted to make sure that um, everybody got the card on the way in. You know, the card uh, for that thing that's, ha yeah. It's what? It's not a surprise. This isn't a surprise? No, he, he knows about it. So you can let everybody know. Oh, so he knows about the, the yeah. one. It's a surprise to you, it's a surprise to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens a lot. So he knows about the one th when I. Yeah. yeah. He, he knows Excuse about me, the card. It's not a surprise. <laughs> if you didn't get a card, make sure you get one. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that surprise announcement. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? Regarding that surprise card, um, if you pick one up and you're going to send it to somebody who doesn't make it to church, or you just might want to send one to someone. Um, there are envelopes in the back of the uh, box. I didn't put the, the um, cards in envelopes because uh, what does everybody do? You open up the invitation, you throw away the envelope. So I figured I'd save a couple bucks. And you know, as we're all getting <clears throat> older and we're on Social Security, we have to save our nickels and dimes, right, Pastor Bill? <clears throat> <laughs> And I'm still waiting for people to send me things for the ROYP3 page if your young person is involved in. That was um, easy. 
if your young people are involved in uh, music, academics, would you stop? (sighs) Would you believe he's going to be 70? It's more like seven. (laughs) Anyway, if your young people are involved in academics, uh, sports, music, anything outside the school or outside the church um, in the community, please let me know so we can put it on our page in our um, church uh, web page. Um, also, um, we had a choir practice scheduled for today after church, and there's a conflict with the chili cook-off. So instead of having choir practice, we'll just put that off and we'll meet uh, Sunday morning at 9.45 here in the sanctuary to start. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other announcements? Seeing none, let us continue with our call to worship. God of hope, we come into your presence this morning with confidence that you will meet us here. Where there is sadness, bring joy. Where there is tiredness, bring refreshment. Where there is despair, and bring a renewed sense of hope. Let this place be a sanctuary, a safe haven for us a home for holy words and songs and prayers as we devote ourselves to you. Please join us in the praise hymn number 723. Good morning. All right, we're going to open with some prayer and then get on. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for all in attendance. And Lord, help us to use this time of, of corporate worship to, to give you the worship that, Lord, that is already yours. Lord, you are worthy. So, Lord, help us to remember that and sing praises to your name. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And let's keep that praising going with our next hymn, which is going to be on... Uh, number 27, O Worship the King, sing in verses uh, 1 and 2. Within your bulletin, there is a little piece of paper that looks like this. Um, if you haven't had time uh, to write your prayer requests, that's what you, what you write them on. Um, Drew is going to come around and collect those. Uh, what we do with the prayer requests is send them out 
hold on, I gotta just make sure, there you go. That you uh, fill them out, put them in the box, and then Pastor Bill sends them out to his prayer network, and so you get all types of people praying for you. So now Drew is going to go around, and while he does that, we're gonna sing our next hymn which is Jesus, Lord Jesus, think on me. This is found on 462, doing verses 1 and 2. Let's take thee the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I lift these up to you. Lord, um, we know that you don't need to um, have them written down for you uh, to know our, our needs and, and desires, Lord. Um, but Lord, we, these are really important to us, Lord, that we, we did write them down and that we have others pray for them. Lord, there's important things like financial troubles, or health troubles, or any other kind of troubles, um, that we know that you can uh, help us with. So, Lord, we lift them up to you. We ask that you would meet them according to your will. And we just thank you that you are a God that is so powerful and so mighty, but yet turns his ear and hears his children's prayers. So thank you, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we are going to take communion now. And before we do that, we're going to sing a hymn. But before we do that, that I'm going to do my little spiel. So... We now have the privilege of gathering together and participating in communion. We do this together to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. And that is the key. Um, that, uh, that thing, that our Lord and Savior, our only one qualification to participate in this communion is that you do in fact have a relationship with Jesus. That he is your Lord and Savior. Um, if you haven't done that, we'll have a silent prayer before we start, and you can receive them then. Um, it's a, probably the most serious question that you'll ever have to face in your life. Um, that A serious question, uh, that what will I do with Jesus? Same question Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Uh, the time of prayer is also a time when we bring and confess our sins to God. We make no mistake that the blood of Christ covers sins past, present, and future. The cross is sufficient, but the sins of our flesh still commit, that we still commit breaks fellowship with God. However, like a disobedient child, we have gone uh, against our Heavenly Father's wishes and produced a fog of tension between us and Him. However, like a loving Father, He continuously woos us back with His love. And if we confess our wrongdoings, He is faithful to forgive us. So let's, let's do that prayer now that... We'll give you some silent prayer and then we'll, I'll end it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you that you have called us. You've called us into a relationship with you and that you've called us to this table. Lord, it's really humbling that the maker of everything, of the universe and of us, that you would call us to have a meal with you. 
a meal that lets us remember the horrible death to pay for our sins that you took on. So Lord, help us to um, remember that. Lord, wash us away, make us white as snow. And Lord, help us to, to draw close to you in this intimate time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, before we come down, we're going to sing two verses of the hymn we have under there, which is on 782, Come Share the Lord. the diagnet bring forth the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, bless this bread. Bless the time that we have to remember your sacrifice. Amen. The body of Christ broken for us. You may partake. Now with we'll the diet and come forward with our juice. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for sending your son. Lord, thank you for his, his death that he went to and the blood that he shed. With this juice, help us to remember that, that that shedding of blood is what reconciled us to you. 
and pray in Christ's name. Amen. blood of Christ shed for us, you may partake. Let us sing the third last verse of Come Share the Lord, which again is found on 782. Today's scripture reading is taken from Psalm, verses 3 through 7. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my requests. In, in the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. I know you all thought I was gone. Children, I'll do like Andrew does. I'll preach to the adults. That was easy. That was easy. Hey, Runt, come here. Josh can come down. Just because you're a wrestling champion doesn't mean that you don't have to come down. How many of you honestly struggle from time to time with the Lord, with your friends, with things in life in general? Can I give you a scripture? Matthew says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I bet if I ask the adults, how many of you adults struggle on a daily basis with something? How many of them raised their hands? A lot. All of them? Well, you see, if they would pay attention today to this message... 
they would be able to go and go, that was easy. <laughs> because you know why it's easy? If we give Jesus all of our burdens, all of our problems and troubles, and I know some of you have got great big troubles. Some of the adults out here have great big troubles. Wayne and Doris have a great big trouble. Bill and Beth Wagner have great big troubles. And when we take their troubles and put them against what we struggle with, sometimes I look at my struggles and I say, why, Lord? Not why me, Lord, but why, Lord, do I complain? How many of you have ever complained about something you had to eat, something you had to wear, something you had to, right? Well, here's the answer. That was easy. Because if you trust God, it'll all work out in the end. If you go to your moms and dads and talk to them and say, hey, how did you get through being a freshman in high school? How did you get through biology class? How did you get through? Hmm? How did you get through? You know, ask mom. Because every one of our moms, every one of our dads has had problems. Every person sitting in this room raised their hand, didn't they? Do you know why we, we forget? Because it is so, that was easy. so easy to trust God. But it's so hard for us to do it because we like to hold on to our problems. It's, we feel comfortable with them. Because if somebody says, what's the matter with you? You go, oh, you don't know what I've got to deal with. My mom made me feel so bad this week. My dad, whatever. Just remember, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest that God gives us is peace. The peace that passes all understanding. I'm a type A personality. Y'all may not know what that means, but I like to make sure I know what's going to happen. And our baby granddaughter went on a dance last night. <laughs> she looked beautiful. She looked gorgeous. And that made me more upset because I know what you boys are like. <laughs> but you know what? I was working on this message last night and I heard this. That was easy. So... I got real humble, and I wrote on my daughter's Facebook page, she looks beautiful, tell her to have a good time. Do you know how hard that is for me? Because I wanted to go to the dance with her. <laughs> but I couldn't. Have you been to a dance yet this year? Nope. You let me know when you're going, because I'm going with you. Amen. <laughs> Drew, you been to a dance? Good. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> oh, no! Wait a minute. That was easy. <laughs> I've got to trust God. And that's what you all have to do. Can you remember that? Just remember this. That was easy. Okay? Go ahead. Although you don't get to leave today. Ha ha. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. We'll die and come forward and we'll take our morning offering.
give tithes and offerings. Help us to be good stewards of what you've given to us. And Lord, help us to use it to further your kingdom and further reach out and build up your, your flock. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It gets weird when he approaches 70. You only get one. <laughs> one a day. So the false teaching that would later spring up out of this was known as uh, Gnosticism. Uh, and Gnos, the, the word Gnosis is, a, is the word for knowledge. And this, this was like around secret knowledge that um, only el the elect kind of people would have um, knowledge of. And it had some, uh, several striking characteristics. For one, it was Jewish. It stressed the need of observing Old Testament laws and ceremonies. Two, it was philosophical, laying an emphasis on special or deeper knowledge. Again, they would say, oh, if you're really good with God, you have this secret knowledge and the secret handshake that nobody else knows about. Um, it also involved the worship of angels as mediators to God. Uh, it was exclusivistic, stressing the special privilege and perfection 
of those select few who belonged to this philosophical elite. And fifth, it was also Christological, meaning that it's attacking a certain char characteristic of Christ. Um, so this seminal Gnosticism, Gnosticism denied the deity of Christ, thus calling forth one of the greatest declarations of Christ's deity found anywhere in Scripture, which is the exact Scripture that we're going to look at today. So the purpose um, Paul sought by writing this letter is to show the deity and supremacy of Christ in the face of said heresy and lead spiritual uh, believers to maturity and to elicit prayers on his behalf. So let's actually read uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. So starting with 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him, all things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, as well as the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself may, come up, may become first in all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son, and through him to reconcile things to himself by making peace through the blood of the cross through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So Paul is describing Christ in two different ways here. He's showing the relation uh, between uh, Christ and God and the rest of creation. And on the second thing, he is also showing Christ's relation uh, between him and the church. So starting with chapter 15, we're going to go through and, and, and hammer this stuff out. So starting, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And uh, in the adult Sunday school, we, we hit on this every once in a while, that what does image mean? We know that Adam is created in the image of God, and so it, what is this relation to image? Well, here, this image is stressing that Christ is the exact revelation of what God is and who God is. He mirrors God perfectly. For one, he, he is God. Um, and so, if God is, if Christ is uh, showing God perfectly, and on a side note, on Malachi, this is back in the Old Testament, uh, 3, 6, states that the Lord is immutable. And that's a fancy word, meaning that God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, tomorrow, forever. So, if Christ is the image of God, and God is unchanging. What can we know about Christ and his image? For one, it says, before Christ took on flesh in the incarnation, he was the image of the invisible uh, God as the word. Uh, if you flip to John, uh, first, or John 1, verses 1 through 3, that's that whole introduction. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, and so forth. That is pre-incarnate Christ. Two, he has eternally been the image of God. The image is uh, the God who created worlds and appeared to the patriarchs. And three, in his flesh and in his glorified state, and everywhere in between, the second person of the Trinity, its central characteristic being the image of God. He is always the one that will show God perfectly. So moving on to the next word here, so what does the title firstborn mean? Uh, one of the meanings is that it is uh, one of the titles for the Messiah. And within the context of the day, the firstborn is the one that has first crack at everything. They get first crack at uh, the honor. They get first crack at the uh, inheritance, everything. And it's important to, to remember the inheritance part. Um, so to mean that Christ is firstborn all over all creation, it means that God the Father has given rulership to the universe, uh, to the Son. Christ is the Lord of it, and he is supreme over everything. Uh, it also highlights the distinction between Christ and creation. Jesus existed before 
creation. We sometimes get it, you know, hard to wrap our minds around that Jesus is man and Jesus is God. But Jesus existed before he took on that incarnation in flesh. And he is before all creation. So moving on to uh, verse 16, for all things in heaven and earth were created by him, all things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So in this next verse, we have this, this type of evidence laid out that Christ is indeed the firstborn over all creation by showing kind of like how far his supremacy goes. Um, in three specific ways in which Christ and creation are related. In, or some of your tr translations say by, mine says by, it says, uh, were all things that were created, and all things have been created. Second is creation is through him, and finally creation is for him. So with the, this, uh, the part, all things in heaven and earth, all created, animate, inanimate, everything, um, were created by him, and this means that Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is the main agent in creation, and that all of the energy and the power that God needed to bring the universe and everything else out of nothing is found within Christ, within God himself. Um, and then we have all things, whether visible or invisible. Um, Non-material things, um, the laws of nature, the spatial vacuums, everything, all the, everything is created by God. But also invisible, this is also referring to the spiritual realm. And remember, the, the heresy that's taken place is that uh, angels can also be worshipped, and they're kind of like the mediators between uh, humans and God himself. So when he says uh, visible or invisible, and then lists the type of invisible things, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers. Paul's kind of laying out this angel hierarchy, saying that, okay, here's these different hierarchies of angels. Not necessarily that this is how the hierarchy goes, but he's saying that you have these level of angels, and then these levels, and these levels, and these levels. And Christ is above all of these levels. So even if you think you're going to the tip-top angel, you're still that angel is below Christ. Um, higher than the angels. Angels are in the created order, and thus Christ uh, should be the focus of the Colossians' worship. Uh, on the next part here, we said all things were created through him and for him. This is, again, a restatement of the first clause, only now, since we have invisible things, he's throwing that in under there, too. So we're created through him, showing the relationship of the agent and creation. Uh, this is not to minimize God the Father in the whole thing. Again, all of the members of the Trinity are unified, and they all work in this cooperation together. The Father hands down what the firstborn Christ's inheritance is, which is dominion over everything and the creation process. Um, however, God the Father and the Son cooperate in creation with God. The Father makes God the Son the main agent within the creative process. And then for him indicates the whole goal of creation, of everything. All things have been made to glorify Christ for him, to achieve his purposes through, and to have authority over. So, as you're in bed or wherever you do your toilet, wherever you do your, your deep thinking, <laughs> I, do, I do them in both places. That's probably why Jenny's like, hey... What are you doing in there? I'm just thinking, counting the tiles. Um, that and I watch funny videos. Um, <laughs> it's a good place if, if, they, if they elicit, you know, like, ha, 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 and then you're just right there. Bathroom humor in front of the congregation. Anyways, you think about what is the, <laughs> the, main, the, the main goal of life. What, what is life all about? And in its short, broad kind of context, it's, it's Christ. The main goal is Christ. Um, there's a lot of other intricacies of what that all means, but if you're having ex existential crisis right now and just want the broad strokes, there's the your broad strokes. It's the end and the start and the goal, everywhere in between of creation is Christ. 
Uh, and from this, all summarizing here, Christ stands at the beginning of the universe as the one through whom it came into being, and he stands at the end in the goal. Ephesians 1, uh, 10 can be aptly applied here too, which asserts that God's plan is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So moving on to verse 17. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. Again, this is a summary of the verses above, and it means that by which God holds the whole universe together is Christ. And I would just want to make a little note on the side that when we say that all things are held together by Christ, it, it's not, I don't want to uh, leave you thinking that this is some, that the gospel and, and God is somehow anti-intellectual. Um, that there's not actually a big guy with a beard that's holding everything together and every, just keeping it, you know, like you look at the old-timey Greek kind of things where someone's holding up the world or whatever. This is saying that anything that is active, anything that's non-active, anything, the whole thing is held together by Christ in that he is the one that sustains it. Um, he doesn't have to do any kind of exertive force to do that. Just because he allows it, it happens. He's the sustainer of everything. So moving on to the second way in uh, Paul relates uh, Christ is he's relating it to the church, and this is picking up in verse 18. Verse 18 says, He is the head of the body, the church, as well as the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he himself may become first in all things. So starting off, he is the head of the body, the church. Um, there's a good commentator I really like. It's called Douglas Moo. Um, and he has a, a good quote here. It says, In the ancient world, the head was conceived to be the governing member of the body, that which is both controlled and has provided its life and sustenance. Christ is the locus of the church's unity and coherence, the source of the church's sustenance and direction. And this development may very well be stimulated by the class and false teaching itself against people who were arguing that the ultimate spiritual experience had been found in places in addition to Christ. Paul holds up that Christ is the one and the true only source of life for the body. Just as Christ is preeminent in the universe, so he is preeminent within the new creation, the assembly of the new covenant of believers. So, just as how Christ controls the whole universe and sustains it together, just how we are a church body, different denominations and everything, but we are the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. We are all the fingers and toes and arms and whatever, but we are all controlled by the head, which is Christ. That is where we derive our authority. You don't drive your sole authority from me. You don't do it from Pastor Bill. You don't do it from uh Tom, Miss, whoever that lives down the street from you who's really good and has got cool Bible programs on his computer, it's from God himself. God is the head of the church. Um, and it goes on to say, as well as the beginning, he is the one that brought the churches into being. It, the reason that the churches are there is because Christ is there. Uh, and then it also... Uh, refers to the next kind of clause that we're going into. So the beginning as a church, but he's also the firstborn from among the dead. That he is the beginning one uh, when it comes to people coming back and being resurrected. Uh, he is the first one to rise from the dead into a new glorified state. Um, and on a side, another side note, another cool, interesting thing. There's two groups of Jewish people uh, back then. You have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and one group is saying that uh, the resurrection of the dead is just a mere spiritual thing. There's no physical type. And the other one is talking about a physical type of resurrection. This whole thing, firstborn from the dead, presupposes that there is going to be a final resurrection. So the mere fact that God, that Jesus, has come back from the dead kind of guarantees, puts a stamp on that is what's going to happen to us too. Um, it's because of his raising that others rise through his power. Um, and that we are going to rise into immortality just as he has. Uh, he is also the highest rank from those back from the dead. His raising precedes everybody else. Um, 
and he has authority over the death, conquering it by raising it from uh, being dead. So why, why do we say firstborn from the dead? It's the same thing of Christ is the firstborn as we already went through it. Christ is preeminent, meaning he's first in all things. So if he's going to be a part of the church, be a part of the head, he's going to be the first in that church. The first one to resurrect into the church is Christ. Therefore, he has to die and raise so that he can become preeminent in all things. So in all things, um, so far we have a checklist kind of thing going here. It says that all includes the universe, the image of God, creator, bestower of blessings, old and new creation, the church, everything. There is no nothing out there that Christ's preeminence does not touch according to his good-willed nature. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son. And what, if you ever pick up a, a commentary, um, there's some in the basement or something, you can get a humpteen different little cool tidbits on other little words. So we're going to look at the little word for. And um, for in here, it links back to verse 18. Then saying it's giving more evidence to Christ as preeminent in all things. And that's because God has placed his fullness within Christ. Christ has all of these preeminent authority because he is firstborn from the dead and all this, but that is all because God placed his fullness within Christ. So what does that actually mean? What does his fullness mean? It means that the totality of God, all the power, all the sovereignty of God dwells within Christ. His glory, his grace, everything. When uh, Christ entered into flesh, the totality of God resided in him. And that's the, that's the cool thing, that when Christ was in the manger, all the power, all the glory, everything, all the fullness of God dwelled in a little bitty baby. And that it, it, it's just kind of staggering to, to think. That's, that's one of the things when I, I just kind of can drift off, as I am now thinking about it, that just the magnitude of how gracious and how powerful our God is. Our God's not like um, how the uh, Islamic God is, saying that God, could, God couldn't come into the, the human flesh and do that. God, God just can't do that. Our God can our God can put himself on the level as us condescend to us and show what he is really like. And he entered in the same way and even in harsher, condition, harsher conditions than most of us were born into, which is just, a, again, I'll, I'll keep going or else I'll just stare at you guys like, let's just be creepy. So it is also his permanent dwelling place. If you flip back to uh, John chapter 1 again, um, I think it's around verse 14. It says that um, Christ uh, took up residence among us. And the word took up residence is, again, um, you could translate it tabernacled. And this, um, I've got up here and talked before what the, the main thing with the tabernacle is, that in the Old Testament they set up the tabernacle and God's residingness resided in that little tent. Now God resides in in Christ, the fullness. And then through the Holy Spirit, we become said tabernacles. So he's a permanent dwelling place, and that's not to say that God has changed. Again, God has stayed the same, but God has taken on an additional nature to his already divine, which is the human nature. Another quote from Mu here. It says, although it is unlikely that fullness reflects Gnosticism in any direct fashion, again, Gnosticism is coming into uh, full-blown swing around the 200s, and again, we're in the 60s and stuff, but it's dealing with the, the preliminaries that's going to uh, mushroom up into um, Gnosticism. That Even though it doesn't do that, this, this word still has a kind of polemic thrust. It's, it's attacking this uh, thought process. It says, uh, this is because the word is used, um, almost never used absolutely else in the New Testament, at least in this kind of sense, this fullness word. Uh, all things in other passages 
where it is, has a Christological significance are closely related to this passage. So this is kind of like this grounding passage that ties everything else out there. Uh, we might summarize then that the false teachers in Colossae were inviting the Christians there to experience true fullness by following their philosophy and rules, to which Paul responds, the fullness that you are seeking is found in Christ. And the use of the word all here confirms this supposition, since it is tautologous. And you may what, what is he saying now? It, it's kind of like a restatement, a, a redundant kind of thing that says all the fullness, where fullness is already expressing a type of totality. So or Paul is putting a double stamp on fullness. All the fullness that you ever want, ever need, and that is actually true, is found within Christ. Um, reflects this exclusive emphasis uh, and is Paul's response to the Colossian false teachers. Only in Christ's fullness is found. Um, and then finally, our last verse here, it says, uh, through him to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So the first, first part here, and through uh, him to reconcile all things to himself, that it was pleasing for God to have his fullness dwell in the Son and to also reconcile all things to himself. That Christ is the main agent when it comes to creation. Christ is the main agent when it comes to reconciliation of people, of creation, of everything. Uh, by making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Christ's death on the cross was the method that God chose to bring about this reconciliation. Peace is found through the historic event of the crucifixion of Jesus. That is a really cool thing about our religion. Um, it's not some pie-in-the-sky, hollow philosophy that you really can't prove or disprove. This, everything in here, is going to be grounded in historical fact. The actual peace, the actual reconciliation, that act that brought all that together in that moment and then in the future context is found at that historic moment when Christ is hanging on the cross. A historic fact that both conservative, uh, more liberal, uh, non-believers will agree that it definitely happened. Christ was definitely hung on the Christ and died and put to um, in the grave and then the grave was found empty. It's, it's just crazy that all of the things that God has given us, um, history and his word. And so through him is mentioned again at the end here. And this is highlighting that Christ uh, in his totality uh, is what brings recon, uh, reconciliation through. If you leave off the, the through him again after the blood of the cross, you could see that some people might have this magical kind of thinking that I need to go up and get to the cross and actually wipe the physical blood down. It's through the shedding of the blood. It's through Christ, his blood, the totality of his being. Everything is where this reconciliation comes through full circle. Things on earth, things in heaven, God will bring all things together to himself. We're reconciled with God. We're reconciled eventually with each other. You may hate your brother, sister, aunt, I don't know, whoever else you, you don't like. Eventually, you will be brought into harmony with them. And then also everything in nature. The world seems chaotic now and all that, but God's death, Christ's death, is going to reconcile all those things. He is the, the order that brings chaos under all control. So um, this is a, a cool little thing that we went through, but you're, you might be thinking, well, this is all kind of like head knowledge. It's, you know, I, I can understand that Christ is full and everything else like that, but how do I, how do I apply this? Um, so number one, we have to ask ourselves, do we have a view of Christ that has the fullness of God within him. Um, one of the things uh, that one of the first uh, teachers when I went to, to seminary was somebody said something and the, the, the kind of jib 
or jab up there is, well, your, your God's too small then. And it, it just makes you want to slap the other person. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. But, I mean, it's, it's a good kind of thing showing that, hey, are you, is your God big enough to deal with that stress that you have in your life? Um, and so you have to ask yourself, is, is my God big enough? Is my Christ that I have put my strength and salvation, is he strong enough to help me with whatever problem I have going on? Is he able to give you salvation, but not strong enough to help the person that wronged you, to forgive them? Is he powerful enough to bring the universe out of nothing, but not able to help you love the Muslim, or the atheist, or the homosexual, or any other kind of fellow brother or sister in Christ, even people in the church? We might be like, oh man, I hate that person sitting in front of me. I wish they would just... Is God powerful enough to reconcile you with your own brother and sister? Who, might I add, you will be spending eternity with these people. You better get on their good side now. You're going to see their face, whether what, I don't know what their face is going to look like. But you're going to be spending eternity with these people. Uh, to the teens. Actually, I skipped one. So are you content in Christ alone? Do you need material things or other relationships? to keep you, uh, that hole within you, full. Uh, to teens or even adults, are you taking advantage of the fact that Christ, in Christ you lack nothing? That you don't need someone else to complete you? Um, just talking about, and this is a normal thing where you go through high school and your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you. And it's like, you know, you just want to go out and be like, oh, it's all over. It's, it's not all over. You may be feeling that now, but in truth, in actuality, you have everything that you need within Christ. Amen. Everything that you need, that hole that is in you, it's the Christ-shaped hole. It can only be filled by him, and you only get satisfaction in him. Uh, not that material goods or relationships are a bad thing. They're great. And again, God is the giver of good gifts. He gives us these things. He gives us material things. He gives us these relationships. But we shouldn't put the creator and the giver of gifts off his throne and put the things, the good things that he gives us on the throne. Christ is preeminent in everything. We just learned that. So he's going to be preeminent in our lives too as believers. So we have to constantly, not constantly, but through our things, make sure we're checking where Christ is is sitting, whether he be on the throne or if he's on a couple little steps down there and hanging out. Two, is the church that we attend now or in the future, a lot are young, if you go out to another church visit or if you say, man, I really don't like Andrew's face, I'm out of here. If you go to a church, is that church that you're attending, do they have a correct view of Christ? Um, that we are the members of the body of Christ and we have to make sure that when we go out with other members, we have to make sure we're in the right body. You don't want to be attached to a body that is not actually attached to the head because what's, what's a body without a head? It's a dead body and it's just going to produce dead people. Um, so in our church, we need to know what the real Christ is like so that we can combat false images that come into the church, just like the Colossians. If someone comes in saying, oh man, I just love this new book I got from the Christian bookstore, and it is really digging it. It says Christ and eating green leafy vegetables. That is the way to true fulfillment. And you, you got to be like, mm, I, you know, Christ probably ate some kind of greens, but I don't think he included, you know, a salad was not crucified up there on the mound with him. It's Christ. So, we need to know that. So, with, um, we need to know that there is no Christ and. Christ does not have a sidekick. He's not sharing his glory. He deserves all the glory. Um, but if someone comes into our church and has an incorrect view of Christ or the Trinity, do we just say, oh, well, <laughs> you're dead weight. Get out of here. No. Again, having the information the correct information about Christ, which we find from the Bible, helps us to instruct others so we can build them up in Christ. 
we must teach and instruct from the Bible to show the true nature of Christ. God's self-revelation found in the Bible should be our number one guide to what God is like, not what we think God is like. If I, you know, if, if we went on what God was like, what I think he's like, we would probably be in a worse situation. Same thing with you guys. You, you might have a nice-looking God in your mind, and he might be good to you, but you stretch that out to everybody else, it's, it's not going to, to work. And why worship a false one when you actually do have the real one right here in the Bible, not the Bible? So what's a concrete way I can use this information? And Pastor Bill has already done something like this in the past where he hands out little cards. Um, if you remember, the, the sin is not my master kind of card. I found uh, kind of a, like a, a same way to do that to where if you have a, a card or something like that, you can write, for example, Colossians 1, 15 through 20 on there. You incur or come into a situation and when you're tempted or if you're feeling down or whatever, you can flip that out of your back pocket and read that. That is the God who loves you, who lives within you, and one other good really point, because I wrote it down, I thought I could be cool and just, uh, it also helps you memorize scripture. Um, the more scripture you take in and memorize, the more that the Holy Spirit can minister you from the actual word. He can push it through there. So I've, I've written down some scriptures, and it's helped me too. I, I whip it out, and then uh, I have like a little pen, and I'll write down, you know, I used it, so it kind of get like a little tally mark on there. But it's something that you can just reinforce, 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 that this is the God who loves you, this God who is preeminent, that came down, dwelt in flesh, who is preeminent in everything, is the God that is on your side when you're in Christ. So uh, with that, let's sing our closing hymn and worship that God who gave himself for us. And that closing hymn, is going to be joy, huh? 20. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Page 20. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, when people ask, how big is your God? Lord, we know now. You're the biggest, the most preeminent one out there. Help us to remember that as we go throughout the rest of our week, that, Lord, there is nothing that you can't help us with. And, Lord, thank you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.